Hello guys and welcome back to our week revision series. In this video, we will be covering week 9 topics. Myself, Ruja Nakara and I am your maths mentor. To begin with, this is the paste distribution table. You can use it while accessing the PDF. This is are the topics that we are going to cover today. Today we will be doing differentiation and integration topics like local maxima and minima, computing maxima minima, then computing areas, Riemann sums and the integral integrals as anti-derivative anti which means integration then computing using integrals like how you can find the area or the volume of shapes using integral first what are local maxima and minima so when an interval is an increasing function let's say from this order it is increasing kept on rising above it will go till this and then again it falls down the red part is the decreasing part of the function and the blue part is the increasing part of the function. In this case, you will observe that this point, this point, and this point. These three points are where the ch graph changes direction. These are main points of the graph. In this point, the points from where the graph starts to go upwards are called the minimas, and the point from where the graph goes downwards are called maxima. This point is similar. You will normally observe that your maximas are above minimas. Not all maximas are above minima. Let's say, for example, you have a graph such thing like this. In this case, this is a maxima, this is a minima. Also, this is a maxima and this is an another minima. Here, this maxima is below this minima. That's why. But in the entire graph, you see maxima will be always on the top. Then comes what are local maxima and local minima. Let's say you have drawn a tangent to a point as we have shown what we classify as maxima and minima in that case let's say that the tangents at the turning points are horizontal which means that they are parallel to the graph x-axis let's say this is something your graph this is your this let's give it three three curve and then this is your tangent let's say this is tangent let's say this is curve and this is your x-axis so in that case you can use this formula if you will recall this, it's nothing but the linear approximation formula. Using this case, you can verify. Using this equation, you can find the value of y at the particular point of x after differentiation. Also, these points that is classified as what we put in A are known as the critical points, if you recall from our previous topic covered. These all critical points are nothing but the maxima and minima of a function where it can be differentiated and at that particular point if you observe the derivative becomes zero. Because they are parallel to x-axis that means that they are uh, horizontal and horizontal means zero degree from x-axis when time zero is equal to zero that's where your slope is zero. Here is an example. You have to give an equation and the calculate and also there are some points which are saddle points. Let's say if you know the this is a graph, let's see this. And this is a sharp point here, you can see. It may appear like it's a maxima, but actually it's a saddle point, which means it's not a maxima or minima. The reason is because any graph for differentiation, differentiable graph doesn't have a peak, means sharp point. Here you can see this is a sharp point, which means it's not a maxima, it's a saddle point here. If your graphs are having sharp points at top or bottom, let's say you have a graph, something like this. In this case, these both are not maximum or minimum. These are not critical points. These are special critical points which are known as saddle points, which means at these points, the graph is not differentiable and there are that are not maxima or minima. Now we will see about the second derivative case. What's this? Let's say you have given an equation, x square. After taking its first derivative, you will get 2x. This is the equation. After taking the second derivative, let's say you will get 2 here. This is your second derivative, which after differentiating, again differentiate. This is also written as t square y upon dx square in your 11th and 12th standard. And what's the use of this? It's used to check if your function is monotonic or not. If you recall, monotonic means either it's straight increasing or it's straight decreasing from a local maxima perspective. Let's say you have a critical point A which means maxima or minima. Then when you will apply it in first derivative, then you can find that it's up or down. Let's say if you will apply, let's say you have x squared has factors of 0 and 1. When I will apply 2 in the first derivative, you will get 2. And let's we will take it as, let's say, 2 itself. 0 and 2 are two solution of your sum equation. Then you will apply, you will get here 0. Is 0, then you will apply in this, you will observe. In this, you will substitute 0 and 2 both values. 
when you will substitute 2 in this value, you will get 4. And you will substitute 0 in this value, you will get 0. And let's say, if your derivative is greater than 0, means with this value, it is greater than 0, yes. Then you will classify this as a minima. You may be thinking that when it's greater, it should be maxima. But actually, minimas are the one after getting derivative which have greater values. Whereas, if this point was, let's say, negative or something. Let's see you take rather than 2, you took the value of uh, minus 1 here in place of 0. So you will get here minus 2. Is minus 2 less than 2? Yes, so it is this. And how you will find it? Let's say I have added some constants. See, for now we will keep this. This will get derivative. So in this case, you will see that this also gives you value 4 and this also gives you value 4. But when you will draw with adding this constant, see, you will find that this value will be on top and this will be on bottom. Then that critical point is flat, which means that it's a sharp corner or something like this. Then you will classify it as a saddle point. And that's why you cannot conclude from that. That's why it's inconclusive that the point that you got is a maxima or minima. Next, as you know, local max and local minima are uh, calculated based on double derivative test near a local plus critical point or something. But every graph also has a global maxima and minima, which means that the entire graph has the lowest point or and the highest point. In this case, you can clearly observe that in x to the power 4 graph, the maxima will surely grow beyond infinity, reach infinity, whereas the minima has itself. That's why graph may have only maxima or minima or both, or sometimes it may have actually none in conclusive order. Let's say you have a line. In this case, you can see this part will go to infinity and this will go to inf negative infinity. Or you may have a horizontal line. In this case, your maximum and minima are same and they are equal to that's right. You can use this, you can take the deriv double derivative of this and you can just check. In this case, as you have seen, x to the power 4 we have taken and after derivative, double derivative you got 0, which means it's inconclusive. Now moving towards the next topic of computing maxima and minima. How can you divide anything? Uh, in this case, I'll take in all the objects, let, let's say you are given this thing or you have asked to generate a maximum area, then you should keep in mind that the more the object gets symmetrical, the more area it can conclude in itself. Let's say you have given some, you will see, let's say this is 4 and this is 2. Perimeter is the same for this and then you take a square of 3, 3, 3, 3, 3. Perimeter is same for both, 12, 12. But when you will calculate the area, it is how much? 8. Whereas here the area is 9. The more symmetrical the object becomes, the more area it can accommodate even with the same amount of perimeter it has. These are some basic areas, you know, of rectangle length into breadth. Here it is nothing but L sin theta, L sin theta. Or you can just calculate. You will take, multiply, add this and then multiply the perpendiculars. Add the parallel sides and then multiply it by the perpendicular height and then half it. Or this is all or you can just break it into a rectangle then two triangles and then keep on adding these are the same then you know any part let's say you have a large circle here let's say you cut it into infinite small strips then when you will open it let's say the best example is that wherever you have a ribbon let's say you have a th thread and if you keep on rolling it rolling it then it becomes a disc like shape in the same way you can open a disc by using a very small height dx Let's say you have to dx as your diameter and you keep on dividing it. You will actually get the entire length. That's how the area of circle is actually calculated. Then come computing areas. This is the same. You have a graph here. Let's say you have, you don't know the actual curve graph. Then you will just keep on adding rectangles until and unless they fit. The more smaller rectangles you make, the more perfect you fit. This small length is known as dx, which means very small part of the x. Then Riemann sum and integral. This is a formula that I would recommend for you to keep in mind. Let's see we have a function from domain D to range of real numbers such that the domain is a subset of real numbers, means range. Then you have the domain's interval from A to B inclusive. Then let's say T is a value at some point in the function. Let's say a partition is made from A where the intermediate points of A is equals to X0 which is keeps on increasing in this order which is equals to AB. And then these values are very small, which means a is equals to x0, which is the first value, and xn is the greatest, or it can be least based on the monoticity of the function, then b. Let's see, we have a choice of xi, which belongs to x minus i to xi, which means that let's see, you have taken a number, 
x1 then they are second number x2 let's say if you took the value of i to be 2 so x2 start with this therefore we define that delta xi is this difference of this then you will keep double print parenthesis is p as max of delta i which means that after doing all this delta i for every single value whatever will be maximum you will take it in the parenthesis p then you will use the Raymond sum with respect to the above defined as this this you will take so now you get this is what is it this is a value belonging to this interval then delta x is the greatest interval of this which means that you first you want to find this delta x for which the greatest is that that you will take and find xi and then you list in this formula to get your answer then using this the integrals were defined which means that limits came into play let's say this is the starting value this is the ending value from a to b these are nothing but intervals written in the integration symbol then this is a function with dx dx means that let's say you need to integrate a function of with some value x then for that you need to add a dx with this if you will only integrate dx it gets integrated to x if you will integrate x with dx then it will become x square this dx is uh, necessary because this allows you to find that which actual function is to be integrated and what others are just as a side functions then this is tell that how you will measure let's say i give you this graph i told you asks you to measure this area so what you will do let's say uh, first you will take the graph from this point to this point in this way and then you will take this point to this point in this graph and then after subtraction you will get or there is a simple method that let's say this is a point a this is point b and this is point c for now so you can just update this rather than writing this to integration of c to b where fx into dx both are fine depending on how you find it is for some functions maybe c value may not be actually given to you in that case you need to use this or you can directly take then here you can see here how integrals are used as anti-derivatives if you will see when you will derivate x square you will get 2x now what is integration nothing but inverse of differentiation that's why it's called integral as anti-derivatives anti means reverse so here you can see if x square becomes 2x in differentiation in integration 2x becomes x square in this case simply you need to increase the x square is there let's say you need to integrate x square so what will you do you will increase the you know, numerator uh, what you say power of this x and they divide by the same power ahead you will find all the formulas for integration you don't have to worry about this this is the same here it's denoted how for normal integ uh, integrations you won't find the limits because you need to uh, integrate in whole parts if you have to integrate among parts then you need to use limits limits are nothing but functions value at the upper point minus functions value at the lower point that's it now these are all the functions derivative form and integral form you can see here you may take a screenshot if you want for this then these are some of the computing integer properties constants always come out of the integration then integration like summation breaks on additions integration doesn't break on multiplication then this is integration of subtraction the integration by parts here you will if you will rearrange this there is no this much but fx into gx which means integration for multiplication is calculated half so after the ending you will just find that function first fx is same then gx is integrated then you will the same for gx and then r multiplied by fx here fx is to be integrated you see this is the function this is the first derivative and this is the second like that integration by parts if you really and they will find the multiplication how you will have to derivate how you derivate it in the same way it's going on reverse order that's a simple way to keep in your mind for integration also it doesn't matter you can quit this year and this year both will be same if you see clearly this part can come here it will become addition if this part goes there it will become addition that's why any part will be same just you need to keep in mind one part will be negative with the integrated functions then these are some other using limits this all stays the same 
Also, you can inverse the limits. If you will from, let's see, you are going from A to B. Then you are going in this way on number line. But when you will go from B to A, your reverse order on number line. That's why you will add a minus sign here. Then for C, let's say you are breaking the limit, means from A to B, you are going then B, then you are going from B to C. So in that case, I, A to C can be written as A to B and B to C, that's what it means here. Then let's see your function fx which is greater than dx. Then there will be finitely many points on the interval between A to B. Because it's obvious, right, if your function is greater than another function, then between them there are surely finitely many points. Then this is a computer. These are the two main you will be most useful, and I will ask you to keep both of these equations in your mind because these are real important. And I will I will ask you to make sure to practice this integration by parts. In this case, the easy integrated functions whose derivative you can calculate easily are to be kept in the form of fx because you have to integrate that part after derivative. That's why derivative of gx might be simple for you. Same goes for this also. These two formulas keep in your mind. That's all, friends. Thank you. Free audio post production by Alphonic.com.